Righto. Um, yeah, so hopefully everybody will be safe, you know, all that business. So we're going to jump right in. We're going to talk about capacitors. So last time we ended talking about capacit what happens when you have capacitors that are in series. Now we're going to talk about capacitors in parallel. Who, who would have thunk, right? So um, another, so, so preface this by saying that this is just a different arrangement of capacitors. So suppose, uh, hold on. Scroll there. Um, OK, right. So suppose, oops. I always forget how different it feels to write on the tablet. Suppose we have the arrangement of capacitors below. So the arrangement here is we have, uh, and let me just do this in color. So we have blue. I'm just color color coding the equipotentials. And then we have green. So the 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 point is is that the equipotentials are just color coded so and then you can um, you can more easily visualize where on this diagram the potentials are equal. So here we might label this VA over here and over here we have VB. And so we have capacitor 1 and capacitor 2. So suppose we have this uh, this configuration. So so the plate the left plate of capacitor one is connected by an equipotential to the left plate of capacitor two. Similarly, the right plate of capacitor one is connected by an equipotential to the right plate of capacitor two. So here, in this case, we have that V, I'm just calling it, I'm just naming it V, is equal to V1, which is just VA minus VB, which is equal to V2. And the reason we know this is because the potential on the left plate of C1 is the same as the potential on the right plate of C1, uh, or sorry, is the same as the potential on the left plate of C2. Similarly, the potentials are the same on the right plates, so the potential difference has to be the same. And so the potential from VA to VB is the potential difference between the plates. And so we're just calling that V. Um, however, one thing to note here, unlike the previous K case, the charges on the plates don't have to be the same. It can be different. Um, and in general, they will be different um, so long as the capacitances aren't the same. So unlike the series case where they had the same charge but different voltages, the parallel case, which is what this is going to be called, they have the same voltage, but they're going to have different charges. So <clears throat> now let's compute the total charge separated by this configuration. That would be the, the, the charge on one plus the charge on the other. So the total charge separated is, like I just said, it's just the sum of the charges. So the total charge is Q1 plus Q2, where Q1 is the charge separated on capacitor 1, Q2 is the charge separated on capacitor 2. So then the question arises, how does the potential difference relate to the total charge? The reason we want to do this is because we want some, some way to reduce this system, come up with an equivalent capacitance, just like we did with the series case we related the total voltage to the charge. So we're doing the, the same thing here. So the total charge, which is just Q1 plus Q2, well, we can use the relationship between the charge on a capacitor and the voltage on the capacitor. So the charge on the first capacitor is just the capacitance times the voltage. And the charge on the second capacitor is just the capacitance times that same voltage, because they have the same voltage. And so, what we're left with is we're left with that the total charge on the on both capacitors is just the sum of the capacitances times the voltage. And so what this indicates to us is that the equivalent capacitance of this configuration of capacitors arranged in this way It's relatively straightforward. It's just the sum of the capacitances of the individual capacitors. 
And in fact, whenever we have two or more capacitors arranged in this way, and I say two or more because you can have three, four, five, so that all of the capacitors have one plate which is connected by equipotentials and they have their other plate which is connected by a different equipotential, we say that those, we say that those capacitors are connected in series, sorry, in parallel. And the equivalent capacitance, as we as we just as we just demonstrated, is just the sum of all of the capacitances in the parallel system. C one plus C two plus C three plus so on and so forth. You could have a whole bunch, all of all of them, in uh, in parallel. Um, I did give you another link for more details and examples. Um, <clears throat> it's just section 8.2 in the Young and Friedman textbook. I linked it in the lecture notes. So the question then is, so, so we've already established that there are two ways that you can connect capacitors. There's, you can connect it so that you can connect them end to end effectively. Let me draw a picture. So given two capacitors, I'm just going to draw them uh, stacked on top of each other, we've come up with two ways. So series looks like this. So we would connect these. That would put them in series, right? Parallel, on the other hand, looks like this. Um, so the question is, is, are there any other ways that you can connect two capacitors? And so with enough thought, you'd find that, well, you could connect uh, the left, the top left to the bottom right, but that's just the same as series. You could connect um, a capacitor, the two ends of the capacitor, you could connect it like this, but that doesn't actually do anything because it means that the plates of the capacitor have to have the same potential, which means it's not storing any charge. So it turns out that this is all there is. You can have two capacitors either in series or in parallel, and that's it. And so what we can do is we can use this, uh, we can use these, uh, these configurations of two capacitors to break down any network, any complicated network of capacitors. So the way that we handle a complicated system of capacitors, or the way that we handle a complicated system of a whole bunch of capacitors, which are arranged every which way, is that we replace two or more capacitors with their equivalent capacitance, or with a single capacitor. With the equivalent capacitance of the replaced ones. Then, and then you just repeat that. So if you have like 100 capacitors all arranged in some confusing way, you just have to look for two capacitors which are in series or two capacitors which are in parallel. Then you replace those two with the one equivalent capacitance. And then you do it again. And eventually, you'll end up with just one capacitor, because eventually everything can like, like you can break it down so that it'll always just be at the end just one capacitor. And then, in order to find, say, the charge or the voltage on each real capacitor, you figure out the charge and the voltage on the equivalent capacitor, and then work backwards. So we already know how the charge and the voltage are related to the the real capacitors, given the information about the equivalent capacitor, i.e. The voltage on the equivalent capacitor for capacitors in parallel is the same as the voltage on the real capacitors and so on. And, and so you'd have to go back and look at the notes to know how those relationships function, but they are there. And so like, I'm, I'm not actually going to do this, but I'll just give you a complicated example or a relatively complicated example. Let's say you had a system like this, 
So this is neither in series or in parallel, because if, if, if all three of these capacitors were to be in series, they would all have to be end to end, which they are not. It's also not in parallel, because in order for them to all three be in parallel, they would all have to have their plates connected, which they're not. So instead, we would replace this, we would replace this capacitor with its equivalent. And then we would see, oh, now these are in parallel. And so this would be replaced with just the, with the equivalent of those two. And then we could solve the problem. If, if we were told that there is some voltage across this network of capacitors, then we would know that same voltage is across this equivalent capacitor. And then we could figure out the voltage and the amount of charge across that equivalent cap capacitor, work backwards, and then work backwards again. And we could figure out how much voltage is on each capacitor, how much charge is on each capacitor. Um, it's, it's, it's a technique of reduction is what it boils down to. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of examples that I've um, linked to or referenced in the lecture notes. There's things like finding the energy supplied by a battery to each capacity in a, capacitor in a network. That's in the Libre text. There's also um, a more complicated example where you insert a narrow dielectric into a parallel plate capacitor. So, that, so that, that seems like it might be unrelated. It turns out it is closely related to this whole business. Or, for example, if you take two charged if you have two charged capacitors and they're connected to each other, how does the charge redistribute? So those are all good examples that I suggest you guys take a look at. They're in the Libre text. But that's that's what. So we're going to put a halt on talking about capacitors now because if we want to talk more about circuits, we need to change gears. And so we're going to do that. We're going to talk about electric current. So up until now. We've assumed that charges just are where they are and they don't move, i.e. electrostatic equilibrium or static equilibrium. Up in, so, so at this point, we're throwing that away. We, we, we're no longer worried about just static equilibrium because in order to have any sort of current or in, a, in order to have any sort of charge flow, which is what electricity is, it's charges flowing from one place to another, you have to have motion. So we can't consider static equilibrium anymore. So the amount of charge this is just the definition. The amount of charge passing through a fixed point in a given time is called electric current. So what this means is if, if you have some amount of charge that goes from one side of a point to another side to the other side of the point in some amount of time, then you have some charge flow and hence some electric current. And so the way that we uh, describe this mathematically is with the capital letter I. And that is represented by a charge by a small amount of charge over a small amount of time, dQ, dt. And intrinsic or inherent to this uh, definition is that this is the charge across a certain point. So the current can be different at different places. Um, so this is the, the small amount of charge, dq, that crosses some particular place over some small amount of time, dt. Now, the units of current should be fairly obvious then. It's coulombs per second. But we it's important enough that we've given it its own name. These are known as amperes or amps. And they're abbreviated with a capital A. So just like how Newtons are kilogram meters per second squared, um, amperes are coulombs per second. But we use amps instead of coulombs per second for relatively good reasons. So first and foremost, this is a relatively simple definition. If you know how the where the charge is at any given time, you can figure out how quickly it passes some particular place. And so I, there's, there's an example that I linked to in uh, again in the Libre text, sorry, in the in the posted lecture notes, um, this is from the Young and Friedman textbook. It's examples uh, nine point one and nine point two in the section in section nine point one on electrical current. So that will give you some good practice just calculating using this definition. Um, as a quick point of uh, as a quick reminder, electrons are negatively charged, and so while the electrons are the things that do the moving the current is defined as the as the the, the the current has a direction it's defined as the uh the direction that the charges are moving in um 
the current is defined as positive in the direction that positive charges move. Now, the positive charges don't actually move. It's the negative charges. But you can think of the negative charge. If the negative charges move left, that would be the same as positive charges moving right. So when we talk about current flow, we're not talking about the directions, the, the direction that physical electrons are moving. We're talking about the direction that is opposite that direction. It's it's an unfortunate side effect of the of the fact that current was defined like th this whole notion of current was defined in the early or in the mid 1800s before the electron was discovered as the charge carrier, and so it was just decided that current is the direction that positive charges go in, and then we turn and then it turns out that we learned that actually the thing that moves is the negatively charged electrons. So unfortunate consequence of the order of discovery, but it's what we're stuck with. Um, so just keep that in mind. Yep, it's, it's, it's less tradition and it's more, at this point, it would be too hard to change because everybody would think that you're talking about a different thing. It's one of those, uh, it's, the, it's the inertia of ideas. Right, so in order to have charge flow, we need to have some charges, right? So the question is, is what happens or where do those charges come from? It turns out that those charges that do the flowing are the free charges in conductors. And hence, that's why conductors let electricity through them. Now, the trouble is, is at the beginning of the quarter, when we were talking about conductors, we said that, oh, the charges can just move for free. There's, there's no cost. They can rearrange themselves however they want. But, it's, but they're not actually free. They're not actually freely moving. Um, <clears throat> there is some real world physics that we kind of shoved under the rug for the purposes of statics. So the electrons in a conductor bump into nuclei, let me put that in quotes, they bump into the nuclei of the atoms. Um, and this, this bumping, this effectively causes drag. Drag in the sense of like air resistance. So if the electrons were moving, then they bump into a into a nucleus, and then they slow down a little bit, then they bump into another nucleus, and they slow down a little bit, they would stop unless there was an, another force propelling them forward. So just like how when you're skydiving, you eventually reach some fixed speed because there's a drag force up on you, but there's a constant downward force from gravity that's downwards, there has to be some force to keep these electrons flowing. The force, that, the force that's propelling the electrons is eventually balanced by the, and I'm going to put it in quotes, drag force, um, which leads the electrons traveling at a fixed velocity. Just like how when you reach terminal velocity while you're skydiving, your speed just is fixed. Traveling at a fixed, and in this case, because electrons move randomly, it's a fixed average velocity. And that velocity is called the drift velocity. It's the velocity that the electrons drift at. Put a underline there because this is a, uh, it, is, it is conceptual. This is, this is conceptual, but it also happens to be true. Um, so it leaves the electrons traveling at a fixed average velocity in the conductor. Now, all of this actually makes sense um, if you think about electrons and atoms as classical things. Like, like imagine your um, what's that game? That game where you drop a like a coin down a whole bunch of pegs and it just bounces around. Imagine that you had like an infinite row of pegs. Eventually, Plinko, yes. Uh, eventually, you could calculate the average speed of the quarters as they're falling down. And it would average out to some fixed number. And it would depend on how tightly the pegs are spaced, um, how strong gravity is, things like that. But that's very 
not exactly, but that, but classically speaking, that's what's happening to these electrons. So what we haven't illustrated, so, so we've already explained where this drag force comes from. It's basically Plinko, right? What we haven't explained is where this, is what this propelling force is. So what could possibly make electrons move? Right, but it seems like there might be an issue because we said that there should be no electric field in a conductor, right? So what gives? So it turns out that our assumption that there can't, or our proof that there can be no electric fields in a conductor is only true in electrostatics. E fields can exist in conductors so long as, so long as the charges are stationary, or rather, so, sorry, so long as the charges are still moving. And that kind of makes sense, right? The reason there's no electric field in a conductor is because the charges have rearranged themselves to cancel it out. But while the charges are rearranging themselves, the electric field hasn't been canceled out yet. It just turns out that for a static electric field, that the, the amount of time it takes for the charges to rearrange themselves to cancel out the external electric field, it's very, very small. But if the electric field is changing or if the charges are flowing and they, they don't actually have an end to get to, well, then that, there just will be some electric field in that conductor. Right, so we know that the electric field can propel the electrons and we know that the drag is gonna slow them down and there will be some balance that causes the electrons to reach some equilibrium velocity. So, and we know that charge, charge flowing, in this case, electrons flowing, gives rise to current, but we should probably do that relationship explicitly. So let's do that. We know that there is a relationship. We just need to make it formal. So there's this notion of drift velocity, which we've already introduced. I'm going to give it's a velocity. It has a direction. Um, and so we're going to call it V sub D with a vector symbol. We also need to know how many electrons cross a given point per unit time. That's what current is, right? Well, it's close to, what's, what, to what current is. Current is a charge across some time. If we just know how many cross per unit time, then we can just multiply by the charge of the electron. The electrons cross a, cross a given point per unit time. We need to know this. And so, <clears throat> What this indicates to us is there's two parts to current, right? There's going to be the part of current that tells you how many electrons are actually moving. Like say you have a big chunk of electrons that are moving slowly, you could potentially have the same current as if you had a small chunk of electrons moving really quickly. So what this indicates to us, these, these two ideas, is that the current is proportional, proportional to the magnitude of the drift velocity and the current is proportional to the, to the number of free electrons, number of free electrons per area, actually, because we're interested in like how many of these, uh, think of it like you have a whole bunch of electrons on a slice, how many of those electrons cross a given point per second. So that's why we divide by area, because we want to know how many electrons in a given slice are crossing. So if they're more tightly packed on that slice, then you'd have more current because you have more electrons crossing at any given moment. Whereas if you had less tightly packed electrons on that slice, you'd have less um, electrons crossing that point at any given moment and hence less current. And so <clears throat> we're, we're getting there. We also find that for a given fixed amount of electrons per unit area and a given fixed drift velocity, if you made the, the thing that those electrons are flown through bigger, then you would 
have more current flow because you have some number of electrons per, per area. They're moving at some speed, but the more area you have, the more electrons you'll have moving at that speed. So this is just to say that thicker electrons, sorry, thicker conductors um, can move more electrons. So we've learned, so, so this is just conceptual. Uh, no, so it, you have to look at the pages. Um, it, the pages file will, or the, the front page will indicate all of the things that will be on the midterm. Um, so, so just conceptually, we've established that the current has relationships to three things. It has relationships to the size of the conductor. It has relationships to the number of free electrons that are available in that conductor. And it has a relationship to the, the speed of those electrons. So we can put all of those things together. So I'm going to draw a picture here. Let's say that we have a cylinder, which is our conductor. It's a terrible cylinder. Say it has, um, say, say we, we declare that this place here on the conductor is our checkpoint. It's where we're measuring the current. It's the how many charges pass through that point per second. So that would be some slice. Um, and then let's say that we just are interested in the amount of electrons between our checkpoint and some previous place. Let's call that, that segment of the conductor delta x. So, <clears throat> so we want to analyze, given uh, some number of electrons. Oh, you know what? Let me, oh boy. Oh boy, what just happened? Went to a different page. Let me draw these in red. So we have some electrons, or pink, I guess. We have electrons just scattered all throughout this conductor. These are all free electrons doing their thing. They're all moving with some drift velocity. We want to figure out how much current it has. Let's say that there, and let's say that there are a total of n electrons, capital N, in the segment of length at delta x. Just give it a name. So the question then is, how long does it take um, for all of the electrons? in the segment to cross the checkpoint. That would give us a good measure of um, current, right? It would tell us how many are crossing per unit time, assuming that, it's, that it doesn't change as the time goes on. So the current there, the current would be the total number of electrons times the charge of those electrons, which is e, uh, e minus divided by the amount of time it takes for those electrons to cross. Here, Q is the chart, the, the, the magnitude of the charge of an electron, E minus. That, so, so the current is really how many, um, how many charges does it take to cross, a, uh, to cross a checkpoint? And so you could see that if they have a fixed velocity, if I had made this delta x bigger, delta t would be bigger. So this doesn't actually depend on the size of the chunk. It just depends on uh, the rate that they're moving at. Because the ones further to the left, the electrons that are further on this side, will take longer. So in order to get them all to cross, it'll take an equally long amount of time. We're just using this fixed chunk because it's hard to use infinitesimals. So the number of particles, or the number of electrons in the segment, is, well, it's n. So n is the number of, yes. Yeah, so, so, so the size of the segment doesn't matter. And we're going to see that it cancels out or that it becomes something else at the end of the day. But we're just inserting this segment so we have some, something to calculate. Right, so the, the total number of electrons in the segment is equal to little n times a times delta x. And here, we're defining little n to be the number of electrons per unit volume. So we compute the volume of the 
uh, of that segment, and then we multiply it by the number of electrons per unit volume. So that will give us the total number of electrons in that space, in that, in that volume. So inserting that, we get that the current is N A delta X times Q divided by delta T. Just as a quick note here, N times Q is rho, where rho is the charge per unit volume. So Q is the charge of a single electron. N is the number of electrons per volume. So rho will be the number or the amount of charge per volume, which is the, the familiar rho that we've talked about. This is just charge per unit volume. And then also as another aside, delta X over delta T, i.e. how long it takes for um, it, an electron over here to go that distance, sorry, that distance divided by that time, that just is the magnitude of the drift velocity, right? Assuming it's a constant velocity, which we do. So the end result is that we get that the current is equal to rho times v sub d times the area. And v sub d without a vector is just the magnitude. So this is all just to say, just by knowing about how these, um, how these what do I want to say? Knowing about how these, con these concepts, current, uh, charge, electric fields, and so on, relate to each other lets us come up with this formula for current. In particular, we used that the, you'll see that the current is proportional to the drift velocity, check mark there. It's also proportional to how many elect, sorry, it's proportional to the number of free electrons per unit area. We've written it in terms of the number of free electrons per unit volume, but because the number of free electrons is constant, you could write it in terms of per unit area just as well. Um, and also, it depends on the area, i.e. if the conductor gets thicker, then you have more current. So there's a check mark for all of these. All three of these showed up in our formula, so we maybe could have even guessed this just by the units. So um, can you explain why delta x delta is drift velocity. So, so it's just the velocity of the things that are moving. So you have, you have a single electron, say here. It's the, uh, it, travels delta, it travels distance delta x in time delta t. That's what that t represented. And so if it travels that distance in that time, then th that's just the speed. And the speed of that electron is defined to be the drift velocity. Right, so there are some examples. Um, that will give you applications of this formula and of these concepts. So one of them is an example of the rotating ring, which is kind of funky. So maybe you guys should take a look at that. It's in the Libra text. It's in section 3.1, uh, example 3.1.1. It's the first example in that uh, section. And then there's another example, which is um, just, an just using this formula, um, <clears throat> using this formula for uh, calculating drift velocity. Uh, and that's in the Young and Friedman textbook. Uh, it is example 9.3 in section 9.2. It's linked in the, uh, in the lecture notes. So this works perfectly well for a nice, a nice like straight horizontal conductor. But what if the conductor is changing sizes and it's turning and so on? Well, then the drift velocity might not necessarily be perpendicular to the checkpoint. Like in this case, we're assuming that each individual electron moves straight. But if it starts to narrow, like if, if our example was uh, a conductor that was shaped like this, then if the checkpoint is some perpendicular thing, the electrons will have to flow inwards, right? So the drift velocity uh, It's in volume two, so it, it's linked. It's linked. Uh, maybe it's not section nine point two, but it's 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 called example nine point three. Right. So the drift velocity. The whole point of this is the drift velocity doesn't have to be perpendicular to the checkpoint. 
just doesn't have to be the case. And so what, what turns out mattering when we're computing current is the perpendicular component. And it should be fairly straightforward as to why that's the case. If you have some drift velocity that's downward and to the right here, the part of the velocity that points downwards is not going to affect how many electrons actually get through this checkpoint area, right? It's only the part that actually gets them closer to that checkpoint. And so, of course, it has to just be the perpendicular piece that matters. So we can formalize that notion. Um, but first, you can also ask a different question. Um, like in this particular example, the drift velocity might be, <clears throat> say, larger the closer you get to the narrowing and smaller as you get as you get further away. So how would we account for that? How do we account for the fact that the drift velocity also is not necessarily constant? Both of these things are true. And so the reason why I'm introducing these ideas is that sometimes it's not enough to just plug into this formula. Because the only time this formula is valid is when you have a fixed drift velocity, a fixed area, a fixed number of a, a fixed charge density. But if those things are changing, it's a little bit more complicated. And so the way that we would handle this is perhaps exactly as you expect. All we, all we do is we add up the contributions in a given cross section. to get the total charge movement. So if the drift velocity is, say, bigger up top than it is down below, well, the way they figure out the total amount of charge that moves across the checkpoint is you just add it up. So you have a lot, you, you get a lot of charge movement up top, then you get a little bit less charge movement below. And so the total charge movement across, say, this cross-section would be the sum of all of those little baby charge movements. And this should start to look really familiar. We're adding up something where only the perpendicular component counts, and we're adding up infinitesimal vectors that can possibly vary at different places. This, this should look a lot like flux. And it turns out it is. This is just current flux rather than electric field flux. So in this more general case, where you can have the drift velocity is different at all throughout the conductor. What we write is we write that the we write j as a vector is just equal to rho times the velocity or the drift velocity at some position. I should write that this is j at position r. So so j basically tells us how much a small chunk of charge is moving at that place. Like, what is the rate at which charges are moving there? And then we can relate this j, also which is called the current density. Let me put a box around this, and then I'll tell you how this is used. j is current density. We can relate that current density to the current just by adding up all of its contributions, j dot dA, where this is the amount of current that passes through a small chunk of that area. And then we add up how much small chunks of current pass through those small chunks of area for the entire cross-sectional area. And you'll find that if rho is constant at every, if, if rho is constant everywhere, sorry, if v sub d is constant everywhere and rho is constant everywhere, and they're perpendicular to each other, then you, this just becomes j times a, which becomes rho times vd times a, which, is, which recovers the original old formula. But you'll see that this is more general, right? Because this, this, this will apply even when the, the uh, drift velocity is different at different places. This is the, um, by the way, this is at position r. The current density is defined everywhere with, or within the conductor, 
And it can be different in different places and it can point in different directions. So there's an example uh, calculating, uh, calculating current density, which I suggest you take a look at just so you can get familiar with it. This is example 9.4 and it's linked to in Young and Friedman in the lecture notes. Um, right, so this tells us, this basically fully characterizes how the current can move um, within a conductor. All you have to do is tell me how the current is or what the current density is at any given place. And I can use that to find all sorts of things like what the total current is through that conductor or what the drift velocity is at that particular place and so on. There's a lot of information to be learned from the current density and the current density is a very useful concept. Now, just to, we're, we're gonna slightly change gears here. Um, <clears throat> this is enough to get us to compute current. But there's a separate concept that relies on charges as well. At the very, very beginning of the quarter, I told you that the total charge in the universe is conserved, right? So if charges can move, that would indicate to us that there should be a relationship between the amount of charges in a place and the rate at which those charges are moving away from that place. And so we can actually derive some nice relationships between the amount of charge at a place and the rate at which those charges flow by using this language of current density. So <clears throat> the, uh, in, in words, this is saying that the rate of charge leaving a volume, that should be equal to the rate at which charge crosses the boundary of that volume. So the way to think about this is, let's say that you're interested in how much charge is in a little baby sphere, right? You have a little sphere, you have some amount of charge in there. The rate at which the charge in that sphere leaves that volume, i.e. the rate at which the charge decreases in that sphere, should be equal to the, the rate at which the charges cross from the inside of the sphere to the outside of the sphere, right? This is just kind of a a statement of fact. And so this left-hand side, this is just minus dq dt. There's a minus sign there because we're talking about the rate at which the charges leave the volume. And this right-hand side, this tells us how many charges are crossing a particular surface. But we already have a formula for that. That's current, basically. Current is the amount of charge that crosses a surface at, uh, over time. So this is equal to an integral over the closed boundary, because if it's a volume, it's enclosed by a closed surface, is the boundary of the volume of j dot dA. It's just the current, so, so the rate of negative, the, the rate at which charge leaves a volume is equal to the current flow through the surface surrounding that volume. That's all we're saying here. And so we can manipulate this just by using our standard vector calculus tools. So first, note that the total charge in that volume, Q, is just an integral over the volume of rho dV, where dV is this the volume element. And so what we get is that the negative rate of change of that charge, i.e. how quickly charge is leaving that volume, this is the negative time derivative of this integral which is just the negative, we can put that derivative inside of the integral. Because we're just talking about the total charge in a volume. It could have been little q, it doesn't, doesn't matter. But we're, but we're talking about the rate at which the total charge decreases. So think of q of t as a function. So, we're, so if the total charge was initially like here, it decreases as charge leaves. So that's why we're using big T, because we're talking about the total charge within a volume. This is not a little baby charge. Um, right, so, so this, is, this is all we're saying is that the rate at which the charge is uh, leaving that volume is the integral of the rate of change of the charge density. And that's just because the total charge is related to the integral of the charge density. And so from that relationship, we get that the negative integral over the entire volume of d rho dt, this is integrated over the entire volume, is equal to an integral over the boundary of that same volume, because we're, we're asking about the integral. So on the left-hand side, we have the volume integral over the, the inside of the sphere. On the right-hand side, we have the 
integral of the chart of the current density that's going from inside to outside, that's passing through that boundary, an integral of the boundary of j dot dA. And so we can use the divergence theorem like we did when we were first talking about Gauss's law because we can relate it, a volume integral to a surface integral or vice versa. And so what we find is we get that minus the charge density, the, sorry, the derivative of the charge density is equal to a volume integral of the divergence of J. Oh, this is over the volume, this is over the volume of the same volume. And so we can now choose any volume and this statement is still true. So we can just get rid of the, uh, get rid of the integrals. And what we're left with is we're left with that the divergence of J, which is that remember it's the current density plus the time rate of change of the charge density is zero. So this is known as the continuity equation. It's a big deal in physics, it shows up everywhere, anywhere that there's a conserved quantity, you can write a continuity equation like this, where J represents the flow of that stuff that's conserved and rho represents the density of the stuff that's conserved. So on the, so the left term, this is the rate of charge flow outward. It tells us, remember that the divergence of a vector field tells you how much is, how much of that vector field points out. And so the divergence of the current density tells us how much of that current is leaving. Um, and rho, d rho dt is the rate of change of charge. It tells us how much charge density is leaving, or it, it tells us the rate at which the charge density is decreasing. And it makes sense that these things have to be the same, or that, that these, these things have to add to zero. Because if the rate of, if the charge, if the amount of charge is decreasing, then that charge has to go somewhere, which means that the divergence of J has to be positive. That, that, that's where this equation comes from. So you're going to see this a lot. You're going to see an equation like this a lot in your careers. Super, super important, like for anything involving, like for example, in, hy in um, hydraulics, you have a continuity equation for your hydraulic liquid because the liquid is incompressible. So, you, so we will have, you'll have a mass density and you'll have a current density of the flow of that liquid. It shows up there, it shows up like in quantum field theory too. It shows up everywhere. Um, so I just wanted to get you familiar with it. This is probably the first time that you've seen it. So that was just a little bit of a detour. Relates to, yeah, it, it's, it shows up in Navier-Stokes as well. Um, it relates to the, this notion of charge conservation. And the only reason we were able to talk about that now is because we had this notion of uh, current density. Without it, we didn't really have the language to discuss uh, charge conservation formally. So now that we know about current density, we can finally, 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 relate how those electrons react to the electric field. Like we know how electrons react to the electric field, right? That's just a thing, it's just Coulomb's law. But what we don't know is we don't know how the rate at which the charges flow, this, this, this would be something like the, uh, like the terminal velocity of these electrons, which is related to the current. We don't know how that's related to the electric field. And so we're gonna talk about that we're going to talk about the notion of resistivity. So from experiments, this is just something that you could, maybe maybe not you, but someone, someone did do this in the 1800s, maybe even late 1700s. We found that the electric field that you apply to a conductor is proportional to the rate at which current flows through that conductor or the current density. So if the electric field is larger on top than it is on bottom, then you'll have more current flowing up top than you will flowing at the bottom. But it kind of makes sense that th these things kind of should be proportional because if you double the electric field, that means that the force that's being applied to each of your electrons is doubled. And so it would make sense that it's the rate that it can move at would be twice as large. Um, this isn't true for every material, by the way. It's true for perfect or for what we, what we might call ideal conductors. Um, but there are other more complicated things like semiconductors, for example, um, that don't have this property. Um, it's also, it also should be fairly obvious that these vectors point in the same direction because the 
the force on any in individual given um, electron is in the same direction as the electric field. And the, and the, uh, the current density is related to the is proportional to the to the drift velocity and the drift velocity is just a result of those electrons being forced in a particular direction so it makes sense that they point in the same direction as well um, and so because they're proportional there is a constant of proportionality now this constant of proportionality doesn't have to be the same for every material or for every substance every sample or whatever but there is a constant of proportionality for any given setup and we call that constant proportionality resistivity. And I'm about to apologize because this is just something that happens. It's called, we used the Greek letter rho. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, rho means two things. It means resistivity. It also means charge density. Fortunately, we won't, uh, why? Because there's only so many letters in the Greek alphabet. In fact, I've seen some math papers that have Hebrew letters involved but it's just, it just gets bad. There's just so many letters. No, you haven't used Z, but Z is used uh, everywhere. Like you don't, so, so like there's, an, there's a notion of which like you don't wanna have too much overlap. Um, anyway, so, what the, so with this constant of proportionality, you'll have to talk to the College of uh, Liberal Arts and Humanities or something. With that constant proportionality, we get that the electric field is equal to the resistivity times the current density. And this equation here, this is known as Ohm's law. Now, hopefully you guys have learned by now that when a thing is called a law, it means that it's experimentally derived, meaning somebody did experiments. Somebody did experiments and those experiments yielded a, um, a uh, what's that? I keep on wanting to say extrinsic yielded a empirical relationship between whatever quantities you're talking about. So the point is, is this is Ohm's law because some guy named Ohm um, realized that current density is related to the applied electric field. And so it's a law, not a uh, theory or a model or whatever. It's a law because it's an experimentally empirically derived relationship. Yes, I think he lived in the 1700s. He's very dead. Um, and so, in fact, this, this is actually, yeah, he didn't explain why, that, that it's just some empirically derived thing. Um, and in fact, this doesn't hold true for every, uh, for, every con for every substance, nor does it hold true for even every conductor. Um, this is like, it, it's, it's just like every other law where it's an approximation, just like Newton's law. But we can do some analysis in the regime where this law holds. So let's discuss this formula. So if we have a large resistivity rho, that would mean that for a given electric field, we should have a small current density. And it, so that, that, that oh my God, you guys. Um, so, so this just says that there are, there are substances that have large resistivities, which means that for a given electric field, you'll have less current density. So this is a, it's a material property is what it boils down to. Resistivity is, depends on what stuff you're dealing with. So let's ask the question, what makes rho different for different materials? Remember, rho is resistivity, which in a way tells us the tells us like how much drag there is for these electrons. If you have more resistivity, you have more drag. And so the current density for a given electric field is smaller. Think of like swimming through peanut butter as opposed to swimming through water. There's more resist, more, the peanut butter has more resistivity. So the, the, the swimmer or the, uh, the swimmer density is, is much, much lower for a given force that the swimmer applies. Yes, thicker cables do have less resistance, and we'll get to that. So the, there are two, primarily two reasons that rho is different for different materials. One of them is just the molecular structure of the material. Uh, the other one might be the other one is temperature. These are like the two primary drivers that make uh, or that change a uh, 
the resistivity of a material. So let's first talk about the structure. So it turns out that giving a full treatment, like a full accurate conceptual treatment of the molecular structure kind of requires quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. So that's hard, so we're not gonna do it. But we can at least make some uh, conceptual guesses. The number of free electrons that, um, that a substance has might indicate that there should be more uh, there should be more current density because even if you have a whole bunch of Plinko pegs for the electrons to bump into, you'll still have a lot of current density because you still have a lot of uh, electrons flowing. So the more free electrons you have, even if the drift velocity is low, you can still have a large current. And so a substance having more uh, free electrons means that the resistivity of that substance should be smaller. Similarly, there's another notion that the atoms that are arranged in your, um, in your substance can be more or less organized. And by organized, I mean, are they like arranged in a nice neat crystal lattice, like where it's just one on each corner of a cube or are they kind of more complicated? So the more organized the lattice is, the, the lattice of these Plinko pegs, it turns out you get less resistivity. And so this is just like saying, um, if you put your Plinko pegs in random places, your, uh, your falling quarters would move more slowly than if they're just regularly spaced. And that's probably something that you could experimentally determine. So those are just two, uh, two rules of thumb for how resistivity can be related to the structure of a material. Um, but we also said that temperature can play a role. And this is a little bit easier to understand. So as you guys may have, uh, so a lattice, a, a lattice is basically like a grid, except there's like stuff at each point on that grid. So think of like a crystal lattice. So a crystal lattice would be like the nuclei of a bunch of uh, atoms, which are arranged in like cubes. Yeah, it's like a grid made up of atoms. It's just for, uh, yeah, it's 10 things, there you go. So, at higher temperatures, you guys learned in 9b that the atoms are moving faster or are moving more. By the way, everything that I'm saying only applies to conductors, does not apply to semiconductors or insulators. And so if the atoms are moving more, then we would have more collisions between the electrons and the nuclei, right? And so if there's more collisions, that means the electrons are going to be slowed down more. And so we would have more resistivity. So this indicates that higher temperature for conductors will give you a larger resistance or a larger resistivity. Um, it, so, so that's for superconductors, uh, but kind of, but superconductors are a lot more complicated. It turns out for semiconductors, <clears throat> you actually get less resistivity at higher temperatures. And the reason that happens is because the superconductors have very, very few free electrons, but when you heat them up to a certain temperature, a lot more electrons become free. So even though the atom, even though there are more collisions, you have so many more free electrons that the net resistivity goes down, even though you're, you still have more uh, collisions. So a semiconductor is just a really, really bad conductor that has like very, that has very, very few free electrons. It's basically what it boils down to. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but that's the basic gist. A regular conductor has just butt tons of uh, free electrons. And that's an that's a, that's a actual measurement unit. Um, more temperature, yeah, so more temperature for semiconductors, more temperature means more free electrons. For regular conductors, there are already so many free electrons, it doesn't really change that much. Right, so we can actually uh, go, look, go Google it. It's a real thing, I promise. So, so it turns out we can actually approximate um, the dependence on temperature. The dependence of resistivity on temperature. So this is this is only true for conductors, of course. So we can approximate it as rho of t, um, which is rho naught times one plus alpha times t minus t naught. Um, and this is where rho of t naught equals rho naught. So, so the point is, is you measure the 
the resistivity at some temperature, T naught, and measure that resistivity to be rho naught. Then you can figure, you can linearly approximate the resistivity at any other temperature by just applying this formula. And so this formula requires an, a constant alpha. This is the coefficient of resistivity. And it's, a, it's again, it's a material property. So copper would have one coefficient of resistivity. Copper, that's not how you spell property. Um, steel would have a different and so on. So there's an example of doing a calculation like this. Um, it's uh, 9.6 in Young and Friedman, where you might use this formula to calculate something. So again, it's linked in the, in the uh, lecture notes. All right, so that's enough about resistivity. Now we can actually get to the part that, that matters to you guys as engineers. This is resistance, which is very closely related to resist resistivity. So <clears throat> there's a difference between how resistive a material is, like how resistive is copper, how resistive is steel, versus how much does this particular thing resist electricity? So that's that. So resistivity answers the question about the material. Resistance answer, answers the question about a, a particular sample, like a particular sample of some length and some width and so on and so forth. So the way that we're going to answer this question is we're going to consider um, scalar quantities rather than vectors. Physicians are medical doctors. So let's, I'm going to draw a picture here. And so let's suppose that, suppose we have a cylindrical conductor. We, a, we have a cylindrical conductor. So by the way, the reason we're considering scalars rather than vectors is that scalars tend to be easier. And so the formula for Ohm's law that we gave here is a, is a formula about vectors. So we'd like to be able to write this in terms of a, scalar equation. So suppose we have a cylindrical conductor. This is just something that's given um, with potential difference. We don't want to talk about electric field across the conductor. We want to talk about a potential, which is the scalar across the conductor. Potential difference V equals VA minus VB. It has a cross-sectional area. So it's a cylinder. So it has a cross-sectional area, A and length L. So I'm going to try to draw a picture here. So we have VA on this side, VB on this side. We have a cross-sectional area A and a length L. So the question is, we want, or so, so the, what we would like to do is we'd like to have a similar equation to this formula where we relate electric field to current density. We would relate, we would like to do the same sort of thing but for the voltage and for the current. We want to relate V to I. Because if there is a potential difference across this conductor, that means that there's an electric field that goes from high, higher potential to lower potential. That, uh, that electric field will produce a current flow, as we've seen from Ohm's law. And that current flow, or, or it will produce a current density. And that current density can be integrated to compute the current. The, the total current through the conductor. So we, we want to be able to calculate this. So let's do that. So we're going to use all of the tools that we have. So the line integral of the electric field is related to the electric potential by the relationship V, which is VA minus VB. That's just an integral from A to B of E dot DL. And here we're going to assume that because it's a cylinder, all of the electric field lines are parallel and all of, and so, so the electric field lines point in the same direction as the, uh, the path length. So this is just the magnitude of E times L, where L is the length. We're integrating from A to B. We have Ohm's law, which tells us that the magnitude of the electric field, also this tells us about direction, but we don't need it. The magnitude of the electric field is equal to rho times the magnitude of the current density. We also have the definition of J. So this is, uh, for constant J. So if J is a constant, i.e. it's the same everywhere, then we can pull it out of the integral and we obtain that J 
is equal to the, the total current divided by the cross-sectional area. Remember that the, that the current is equal to the integral of j dot dA. But if j is a constant and is in the, in the correct direction, then you can pull it out of the integral and you just get that i is equal to j times a. And then we can rearrange to get uh, j equals i divided by a. And so combining all of these, we get that the magnitude of the electric field is equal to v over l. And, but we also get that the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field is equal to rho i over a, combining these two equations. Sorry, this is the magnitude of j. And so combining those two equations, we get that v over l is equal to rho i over a, or that the voltage, voltage difference is equal to i times rho l over a. Remember, rho is the, is the not the charge density, rho is the resistivity. And so we come up with a new number. We call it the letter r, and we write v equals i r where R is rho L over A is the resistance of that sample. So that's the resistance of this particular cylinder, not the resistance of the material the cylinder is made out of, not the resistance of something that's, that, that's any length but that size, it's the resistance of something that's that long and that thick and that material. It includes all of those features. So this formula is also known as Ohm's law. And it's the more commonly applied version of Ohm's law. And the reason why is because it's basically just a rewriting. It just relies on definitions and Ohm's law to rewrite Ohm's law. So what it does, and the reason why we care about this, is it tells us how to relate a potential difference to the current flow for a given conductor. So like I can hand you, gotta have a wire in here somewhere. No, I don't, all of my stuff's in the garage. I can hand you a piece of metal. This is a Swiss army knife. And you could tell me what the resistance is of the Swiss Army knife, say, from one end to the other. So if I apply a voltage from one end to the other, you, if you know what the resistance is, then you could calculate how much current flows from one end to the other. And that would be a different number than it is for something else made out of steel. Now, just like when we talked about resistivity, <laughs> um, we can talk about the units of resistance. So the units of resistance are volts per amp, as we can tell from this equation. But we give that another name, too. It's called an ohm, and we use the Greek letter omega to represent it. Um, so you're going to see this a lot. Like, something has a resistance of 16 ohms. Sorry, that's just the way it is. So there's more examples of this in the um, Young and Friedman textbook that I linked, uh, examples 9.7 and 9.8. Again, those are linked in the. Uh, in the lecture notes. All right, so the last thing to talk about today is ultimate power. Um, no, we're going to talk about uh, power dissipation, power or power usage. So when charges go from high potential to low potential, we know just from the definition of what electric potential is that their potential energy decreases, right? Like the potential energy of a charge is the charge is the magnitude of the charge times the um, <clears throat> is the magnitude of the charge times the potential energy or the electric potential wherever it's at. So if it goes from higher potential to lower potential, assuming we're talking about positive charges, then the potential energy decreases. And the question is where does the where does the potential energy go? When a charge goes from high to low. We know that it doesn't cause a change in the kinetic energy of the of the system, right? It it can't because those charges flow at a fixed rate. They have a fixed drift velocity. So it's not like their speed is increasing. It can't be if their speed is fixed. It turns out that that energy goes to thermal energy. And the reason it does that is the same reason why drag and friction produce thermal energy. It's the exact same reason. You just have random motion that adds to the thermal energy of the system rather than the kinetic energy of the system. So you might ask, OK, so, so the energy of the electrons is decreasing as it goes from high potential to low potential as it, as it crosses a conductor. 
how quickly does do the electrons or how quickly is energy lost? Because we can easily calculate how much energy is lost for a given electron, but it's a little bit more more complicated to ask how quickly uh, that energy is lost. So what we're really asking is how quickly is the energy converted from electric potential energy to thermal energy? Um, and that will depend on how much current is flowing. If you have more current flowing through, um, through a system, you'll have more of those electrons bumping into stuff and losing energy in the form of thermal or and gaining thermal energy. So the more current, the more energy loss. The question is, how much? So it's actually relatively easy to compute. So for a given charge Q, the energy lost um, when passing across a voltage or when passing through a voltage B, a voltage drop, I should say, So the change in thermal energy of that electron or of that charge is just the charge times the voltage drop. So the rate at which the thermal energy is generated is just the time derivative of that, uh, of that energy, right? So remember, power is just the time derivative of work. And in this case, the work is being, is the work is taking potential energy and converting it into thermal energy. So this is just the time derivative of the of QV. And the, volt, the, the voltage difference is just the number. It's not changing with time. So this is dQ dt times the voltage. And we know what dQ dt is. That's the rate at which charges move from one end to the other. That is just the current. So the power. The, this is the energy loss. This is the power dissipated um, through a resistive conductor is the current times the voltage. And in fact, we can use Ohm's law to rewrite this. Just like how we could use the definition of capacitance that um, Q equals CV to rewrite the energy in a capacitor in a few different ways, we can use Ohm's law to rewrite the power loss or the, the power output of a resistor. Um, so we get that the power, which is IV, is also equal to I squared R, or it's equal to V squared over R. And again, some of these will be more useful than others, depending on the situation. Um, and so this, this kind of thing should, be, should look similar to the, uh, to the capacitor. And so it turns out that there is a relationship here. Capacitors have store energy and resistors, which are things that have some fixed resistance. They dissipate energy. All right, so um, I'm going to end lecture here, because that's all I got for you guys today. I finally caught up, which is nice. Um, and uh,